Alrighty, so right now I get to introduce uh, Ron Schwartz. And the question here is, uh, who here does not know who Ron is? <laughs> Raise your hand. All right. All right. Can you really know Ron? We really have the chance. Well, do we really know? <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron, you know. I didn't ask for an application. Ron, you know. Oh, anyway. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, I, I'm kind of in a position now where I've, you know, I've started going teaching folks, uh, you know, a thing or two about flying, but he's the one who taught me most, most of what I know, and he's the 126 pilot extraordinaire, won seven times in the 126 champs. Mm -hmm. Yeah? More than anyone else. Uh, may, uh, well, he, 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 does the, the, is it, well, maybe eight, but we'll count the next one, right, this year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't count it before the contest, though. So, uh, and, uh, he, you know, and one of the really big things that, you know, stuck out to me as I, you know, and I, Paid attention to what all the pilots were doing, but Ron just seemed to be always out there on uh, these, you know, these crappy days, and he's always he was always up to something, you know. He just always had these ideas, of, and you ask him, you know, he's always, he's always practicing, and I was like, man, you know, this guy was practicing for 40 years. I mean, we have no <laughs> shot at this at all, do we? Uh, but in any case, I mean, he taught me a thing or two, and uh, it very much helped, and he's going to share with you know, his his insights. So let's give him a round of applause. And get Okay, I'll do it like this. How about that? <laughs> anyway, <that's, laughs> I'm doing fine. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, I have been around a long time now. I started flying in 1970 and uh, virtually haven't quit. It's been the one thing I really like to do, a hobby that I really latched on to, and I just can't imagine my life without it. So I was asked to uh, talk to you folks about uh, specifically or more uh, pointed toward the folks who just got their rating. They just got their license and they they don't know how to thermal yet, really. They haven't even they've thought about going cross country, but they yeah, that's still way off the distance. So that is the crux of what I've been asked to talk about today. So uh, I reached back, that was like I say back in the 70s, so uh, I, but I do remember learning and it, it, was a, it was a good affair and it never did stop. It's, it goes on today, I, I have to figure out how to make a certain transition or I, believe it or not, <coughs> even with lectures like Eric's and Bob's, I, I have still a lot to learn about thermal. I just, it just, oh my, it's, it's, oh my <laughs> God, you saying it again. <laughs> but it, it's, I can thermal okay. I can. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on, That's Ron. it, that's it, that's it. That's, uh, well, Doug Jacobs was here last time. He says, you know, there's not too much difference in the thermal abilities. People, once, once you've flown <clears throat> over 40 years. But yeah, anyway, we're all uh, equally clueless. I'm, but you've gotten a really good briefing on how to do the thermal, what the thermals are made of, how to do them, how to read the clouds. And so I'll, I'll take it to the next step. And that's, you've just, just got your license, it's springtime is coming up, and what are you going to do? Uh, number one, I think uh, the as I was going through this, trying to uh, figure out what to do, I, I said, "Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about a flight, and and that's what what you do from beginning to the end: the pre-flight, the takeoff, the release, the flight itself, the landing, and then the post-flight, and that's basically what I'm gonna do. And then I got doing it in my mind, and see if I can see it." Da -da -da. Tell me if I do this wrong. Okay, I'll follow my, my slide. Next thing, you got to learn to do a lot of stuff. So how are you going to do it? You're going to start reading about soaring. If you haven't already got your head in the soaring magazine, to all the books that are out there on how to do it, uh, uh, you just have got to start doing the reading to get the background. It's basic academics. Uh, internet web webinars and uh, uh, 
the like. Uh, I'm, I'm not into to tell the truth, but I know they're out there. And I've heard some very good words about them, so there's another story. Lectures, you're at one, so obviously you know that one. Uh, don't forget uh, the conventions that go on <coughs> with the Soaring Society. Uh, it's, uh, conventions are fun. They really, you, you, with a bunch of people, like-minded, all have the enthusiasm, get out there. You get to see some brand new ships, which gets you all excited. But the lectures that go on during the workshops, uh, they're just invaluable to me. I love them a lot. Simulators, I never used a simulator uh, in uh, gliding, but uh, Daniel, for example, has used them just about to the utmost and, and gotten more out of them, and I don't know how he could get much more out of them. Uh, he, uh, he phone flights, he's done testing, he, it's all over. So if you can get, a, if you're into simulators and you can get a hold of one, uh, that's a, certainly the way to go. The last one is hands-on, and that's definitely my favorite. Uh, not just because I've done it that way, but uh, reading, I, I'm a slow reader, and these, like, I like to go to lectures, but it, I don't know, I, I come away a little bit enthused, but then they just tend to sort of fade in the distance after a couple weeks. I'm, what did he say about that? I don't know what he said about that. So if you paid attention to Bob <laughs> Cook and Eric this morning, uh, go through what they said afterwards. Maybe, maybe just, uh, I don't know how to do it. I, I don't do very well. But hands-on, that, that is definitely the way I learned how to fly gliders, uh, just through the regular process and then going out. And if nothing else, uh, Bob Cook's three Ps, uh, practice, practice, practice. There's, there's just nothing that can take any higher uh, level of, uh, uh, what do I want to say, uh, satisfaction and uh, learning uh, to get across. It's just, it's just the way to go. And as far as practice, don't, don't start off thinking you're going to make a 500K trip. Don't even think you're going to make a silver distance trip. That's 30 miles. That's the way to go. But uh, the first part of the flight that you're going to have to do and start thinking about real good is the pre-flight. And this, surprisingly, to me anyway, is probably where you're going to spend, on a learning basis at least, more time, more actual time. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of time learning these things. And... Uh, they're all done on the ground. If you go through this stuff, very little is actually done in the cockpit. Eric said, if you keep your head out of the cockpit, you have things to do, but you don't take these into the cockpit and learn them. You practice what you've been reading about. So uh, on the, on the pre-flight, you're sitting on the ground, Day before the flight, you look at the weather. I have a couple sites I like, and uh, the uh, the primary two I like are Dr. Jack, which gives a lot of information about the weather, how thermal strength, winds, uh, boundary layers. You can get quite technical, uh, but I don't. It's pretty simple. Uh, just are there going to be thermals? How high are they going to be, and how strong are they going to be? And if there's any. Since I'm primarily a ridge pilot, I always look at the wind. And that's the other, the other site. There's a couple real, real fancy sites out there, but the one I still like best is the Wind Mapper. It's just pretty basic. It goes out seven days, and I can sort of keep my head out. And it's pretty accurate. It's uh, just enough for me anyway. One of the things that I think... Uh, What's that again? I, yeah. I, <laughs> wind Mapper. Wind Mapper. Yep. Wind Mapper. And that's, that's yep. the name of it, yeah. And it's, uh, you play around with it, it shows temperature, but primarily I use it strictly as wind. Uh, this time of year, getting on the ridges, you do like to know what the temperature is. But you really shouldn't know, or else you might not go flying. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, I had something else I was going to say. I don't remember what it was. I get in a checklist, though. I, I'm not... 
shouldn't tell you, but I'm, I'm not a big checklist fan. Uh, my pre-flight checklist is uh, once I climb in the cockpit, I've got everything done. I, I do it standing outside and everything's done and <clears throat> I make sure everything's in the cockpit. My, my checklist, pre-flight checklist, doesn't have to do with controls and all that. It has to do with uh, did I, back in the old days, did I have a quarter for the telephone to call? Uh, do I have my handkerchief with me? Everything on the checklist is something I've forgotten. In, 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 Put them in the camera. Uh, <laughs> one, of, one of the things on the checklist that I always get a kick out of, because I have forgotten it once, was a, a parachute. <laughs> I just say, how did I do that? We're out in Moriarty, lined up for a launch, windy. We we're going to postpone the launch. I waited down the wing, went away. I'd already done my checklist and think. And uh, the wind started, uh, or the uh, CD said, okay, it's time to go. So we all get back. Then I climb in the airplane. <coughs> I, I've done my checklist, no problem. So I climbed in, strapped down, looked around, it looked the same to me. And, Something in the back of my mind said, no, nah, I probably forgot something, but why look at the checklist? I've done it all. And uh, it got down, I was number two to go, and there was a tap on my shoulder, and it was the crew from the plane behind me. And they said, Ron, yeah, uh, is that your parachute out on the wing? <laughs> <laughs> so I got on my checklist. That's the way I go. <laughs> Well, yeah, I've got, got two checklist stories. One, uh, we had a uh, contest out in Mifflin. The day was a weak backside ridge, which meant it was blowing out of the southeast. And it was weak, but it was steady. And, uh, but it was so weak that they decided, no, you get 40 gliders out there milling around at 55, 60 miles an hour. It's not a good deal. So they called the task. They said, no, nah, we aren't going to do it. But anybody who wants to go flying, it can go. So I went out, and it was, most everybody left. They went back and landed. And I, I cruised up and down that ridge at 55 miles an hour. It was one of the nicest flights I still remember. Just, just cruising. The air was soft. But it was locked in steady. Just, just really nice. I had no problem thinking about whether I was going to land out or not. This is just gorgeous. Well, it's getting near beer time, so I headed back to the airport. There's the airport down there, and I'm swinging along. And downwind, this is gorgeous. It's just about as windy as anything is in here. Just soft, make a nice turn to base. Okay, I'm right where I'm supposed to be. Uh, turn final. Uh, getting down 500 foot. Uh, things are looking good. 400 foot, 300 foot. The radio crackles. <laughs> Glider on final. Check your gear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, uh, check, checklists can save you from a lot of things. They, they, they save time because you know what you're looking for. You don't have to go through what was that. And, uh, they, they save you stress because you have done all that stuff. And you're not worried in the back of mind that you did forget something. And they also save you from embarrassment. And that, that's where I was today. Because on the ground, uh, the fellow who called me was Tim Wells, a very highly uh, ranked uh, contest pilot out of uh, Harris Hill. And I asked Hank, and he said he forgot about it already, but uh, he, he was standing there. <coughs> Carl Streetick was there, and John Good was there. Now, that, that's about the four <laughs> highest pilots in the whole thing, and I, I showed off right in front of them. <laughs> so, uh, so use that checklist if you finally do get around to getting one. It, it, it'll save you a lot of lot of. Heartache, I think, and uh, it does. It relieves a check that uh, Bob. A checklist that I use, I learned the hard way, is the leaving the house in the morning checklist. Yes. <laughs> because you could come over to the airport and you forgot this or that, yeah. it just ruins your whole day. So um, I have like a winter one and a summer one. Yep. And, 
Well, I'm I'm using checklists more. If your memory, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> electronics. I'm not an electronics guy. I, for those of you who didn't know who Ron Schwartz was, he's a 126 guy. And I, I did fly glass for about you know, seven or eight years. Enjoyed it a lot, but I enjoy a 126 more. And one of the reasons it's a simple machine. It truly is. It's strong. It's steady, and I, I know I've got enough hours in it, I've got it halfway figured out. <laughs> but, but the electronics, I, I haven't really gotten up to speed on electronics. Uh, I was an airline pilot, and I, I had to retire at 60, and I was sort of glad I had to because the glass cockpits were just coming in, and I didn't want to learn all that stuff back then. So. I still don't want to learn that stuff, and I still don't use that stuff. Uh, I, I've used Top Hat in a contest, and but only to go to. That's my only way I use it. I don't put tasks in or anything, and uh, it it keeps my life simple up in the cockpit. I, uh, uh, and, but <coughs> aside from that, electronics are great. They'll they'll do a lot of things for you. And if you do buy something fancy, fancier than the Garmin 12 anyway, which is <laughs> what I'm using right now, the, uh, do, do your learning in the, uh, on the ground. It, it just, and when you're first doing it, it, especially at the stage of development that I'm talking about, where you're, you're just getting your license or just got it, it if you use it for anything, just use it for a go-to, and maybe a wind readout if you'd like to do something like that. Uh, something that you should know how to do is trailer. Uh, retrieve somebody. Uh, this this you got a perfect place. You, you learn it on the ground. You can make all sorts of mistakes. You talk to people. Uh, you go on a retrieve if you can. And, it's always uh, likely that there'll be somebody being retrieved a couple times a month anyway, at least at Blairstown. <laughs> <laughs> Don't forget to pre-flight the trailer, same air, air in the tires, retrieve kit. That's, a, that's one of the hardest things in our club anyway, uh, is getting a retrieve kit that means anything. Uh, you look at it, if you don't have your own mental list of what ought to be in that, you have no idea if everything's there. It's, it's a big box sometimes, it's a littler box other times, it's got stuff just crammed in there <laughs> almost all the time. It's just, uh, so learn how to do the trailer. One day if you're going to go cross country, you're going to land out. And you might as well know how to do that before it really happens. Uh, one other thing about the trailer, if uh, there's a couple, three of us in here that hook up the trailer every time we go flying. Just every time. Uh, it's, it's just a standard thing. And uh, the last time I didn't, the last time I didn't hook up, I landed out. So it's going to get you. So, uh, and it saves you time. Nobody has to go searching for anything. They just climb in the car and come get you. That's a great way to do it. The next one's a task for the day, and this is this is the, the big important thing on, the, on your pre-flight. If, if you have something to do before you know there's a task that you set in your mind before you take off, it doesn't have to be chiseled in stone or anything, but you, you got something in mind, what you're going to do. To me, that, that has made all the difference. It, it keeps you... It gives you a purpose for getting up there, except for flying around. No, when when you first get your license, get up, you're you're very happy just to stay up. Uh, Bob was saying 17 minutes versus 14 is fantastic. <laughs> and it does, and it'll build. But you'll start making cloud base regularly. You'll start moving around a little bit, and you'll say, "Hey, this is great." But then it's going to start. Oh, I did that last. What else have I got to do? And so the, the task for the day is a, just a, a big, big thing to me. And uh, for the newbies, it's, uh, well, my task is to stay up. But all at once you're going to be able to stay up. And then it's going to be, well, uh, okay, I, I'm 
wasn't really thorough and all that steeply last time. I've got to go out and do that. And okay, that that very ometer doesn't seem to be working the way that Eric actually <laughs> described. <laughs> says I can, I, I, I can <laughs> it's, it says I'm going up, but only there and oh, the bump came and then a second later, after he'd gone through how many degrees? Uh, there's where the lift was, was at the bump, not when the variometer started going up. Hey, you got to start putting all that stuff together, but that's going to take practice. And uh, what was the other thermaling thing I had? Oh, as far as steepness goes, and, and Bob's comments on uh, just don't go crazy with your angle of bank. <clears throat> but you will want to get better at that. You, you're going to hit cores days as you're... Uh, you progress along this path to cross country that you're, you're going to want to be able to tighten it up. 45 degrees, my, my average angle of bank, I think, is someplace between 40 and 45 degrees, so I'm very comfortable there. But sometimes i got to kick it up even more, 50, 55. You get much more than that. It gets, I get, that's about my limit as far as being able to control it. But one of the things you can do up there to practice that is to just, okay, even doesn't even take a thermal. You just do it. You put the thing into 30 and start around. Okay, that was pretty solid. 40, 45, 50. And it's really fun some days. After you get halfway good at that, it's a really crank it over. I mean really crank it over. Go 70 degrees or something like that. And just see if you can keep it within plus or minus 10 knots. <laughs> I, <laughs> they're going to be good. They really are. But I was, I can't do it right now, but I was able to back then. I, I was pretty good at that. that it, now, did I ever use it? No. But when I had to crank it up to 60, just to stay in something really tight, it was really comfortable because I knew I could do that. I knew it could keep the airspeed, keep the attitudes right and things. So there, there's one of the two of the ways to, to work uh, thermals that uh, weren't mentioned for, and I, I think they're important too. Therm, thermaling, man, if you if if you can't thermal, you, you're just not going to be able to do it, and you're going to get disheartened. You're going to talk to people. I don't know what the answer is there. I know two people who have talked to me at length. Actually, they call me on the phone. I just had to. You were out in New Jersey, and I'm here in Ohio, and Jesus Christ, I couldn't keep it up, and everybody else was up four hours, and what's wrong? I, I don't know what's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that, that's when you need to go up with an instructor again. I've, uh, I'm guilty of not doing that either. I, I probably would, I have very little dual time. I'm sort of selfish of my time, and uh, it's... Uh, being with another instructor is, and believe it or not, sort of intimidating. It's, uh, I'm God, what are you doing that for, Schwartz? <laughs> <laughs> but I should do that. <laughs> Don't, I should get up. I should just go up just to fly and see a different way of doing it. Uh, geez, all the questions Daniel asked me as he was learning how to fly, uh, I, I ought to have a couple questions for him, and I probably do, but I'm too embarrassed to ask him. So. <laughs> but the task for the day, uh, those, those are the learning things. You're, you're going to have techniques like thermaling, be one and all, but the tasks that I'm really thinking about are little cross countries. What we have here is uh, Blairstown right in the middle. No, no, no. What is it? Well, I was going to tell them later, but <laughs> my, I made this out, and then you got a big kick out of it. The Aero Club Albatross deck. And, then, and that's where we gather after you've done all this. And it's the final stop of the day. It's the deck where we go, and uh, I have to admit, we drink a little bit of beer, and uh, but the conversations are fantastic. You go over the flight. Which is part of the pre-flight or the post-flight part of this uh, lecture, and uh, you talk to people. And why I got that in mind, uh, you get done with the flight, and you get back on the ground, 
and you got a couple things that you're proud of and a couple things you didn't do so well. Well, you ought to talk about both of them. People come up to me and they don't, sometimes, they, they don't feel like talking about their flight because they just got up and they gained 2,000 feet, which they'd never done before. They don't want to tell me that because they know that I've gained a little bit more than that in my life. It's, 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 uh, you shouldn't, uh, I think pilots at every level really recognize what that, what that drawing experience is. And the 2,000 feet is a big friggin' deal if you've never done it before. And uh, so all, don't, don't be shy about talking to other folks about good and bad. They'll, they'll pat you on the back or they'll give you a lecture. Well, maybe you deserve the lecture, maybe not. I don't know. But anyway, don't be afraid of it. But this little, this little thing was uh, the first uh, cross countries I did. It's a, it's a task at the, the Blairstown deck. There's the airport right here. All the blues and the waters around. North is straight up. This is our ridge line up here. Uh, no, no turn point is, is more than about two and a half miles away from the Blairstown Airport. Uh, with, if I only had one turn point, there'd be one, one task to do. If I had two, there'd be two. If I had three, there'd be six. If I had four, there'd be 24 different ways to go around this thing without touching the same turn points twice. And so that's a lot of variety. And when you're first starting out, three miles away from the airport gets to be quite a challenge. You're going to, geez, I've never been that far away from the airport. This is something else. And I've spent a lots of time just going back and forth around the perimeter, across, up, down, around, and uh, that, that one right there, I think, is a 15-mile cross country. That's half a silver, and you've never been more than three miles away from the airport. That's good. In the way, you, along the way you're getting around that, uh, you can, uh, <coughs> you, you, and I, I don't mean these, these circles are only to emphasize where the turn point is. Uh, I like little turn points at this stage of the game because you don't, it, it gives you something uh, specific to go for. You're just not going to head out here and hope to get over there someplace. You got, you got to go there. You got to go. You going to go in that straight line? Maybe not. Probably not. The clouds aren't going to be right there. So you're going to have to do all sorts of little crisscrossing and uh, things like that. Uh, I don't know how many times I've done these. And I, didn't, I did one last year on a real rotten day, but I was able to stay up. I didn't complete it, 15 miles, but it was fun trying. It was something to do. It, 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 it just, it's what I have to do. And what I like to do also <laughs> is I like to say I scare myself. And I, that doesn't mean I go out there and do something dangerous. It just means I'm getting in an uncomfortable place. We all have our envelope that we fly in. How high, how fast, how much angle of bank, how far away we get from all these things comprise the envelope that you fly in. And to, to bang against those sides and restrictions, to me, is always a, a, a joyful thing. I'll get up there and say, OK, I've never done a final glide from this angle before and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, away, away you go. It's just going to be, uh, well, I don't know where I was going with that. Anyway, <coughs> <laughs> dreaming on. That's the, uh, the same uh, four turn points. Any airport you get to. Any, any airport, you can just do a three mile ring, two and a half miles if you want to go closer, four points out there, sort of opposite each other, and you'll have 
the commandment a four mile uh, run, which in the beginning that's great. Four miles is quite a ways out there. And then you're going to say, no, I'm, I'm doing that good. That's, and this is my favorite. This is a, I've done these, I, I did, did them at least, I don't know, probably once every couple months. Uh, just because the weather is down, it's a, a five-mile circle around Blairstown, and picking prominent turn points. I don't recommend on these short ones using electronics at all, uh, unless you really don't know what's out there. Uh, there's there's no need to go from Sunfish Pond to Hope using your GPS. Look out there. I mean, just. That sounds so obvious, but it's not. You know, I, those gadgets will get in your way. They will do that. Uh, this one you can do the same as a four-pointer. You can go all the way around. You can go back and forth. This is this is about a forty-mile task right here. Hit all five turn points and end up back at Blairstown. So there, there's your silver distance right there. It's not legal, but once you've done done that, why can't you go? straight out and do the same thing. It's a, it's a real confidence builder. I, uh, I like this one a lot. It's a, it's a good one. And like I say, any airport can have five points around it. And five points gives you how many different, 100, 120 ways to hit it. Uh, so that's a lot of variety. Bob? Uh, I don't think you pointed it out, but when you do these things, you get to fly into the headwind, with the tailwind, yep. with the wind to your side, and you can kind of see the difference in going those different directions relative to the wind. It also gives you, yeah. on each leg, a different view of the clouds, so you learn to identify yep. which what the, the good clouds look like from different sun angles. And yes, all, all the, those are two big deals about what you're going to learn by doing these comparatively small. But I, actually, that's that's almost, I think that's almost nine miles, eight miles across there. That's a nice long leg. And if you're flying a 126, you're giving up about 2,500, 3,000 feet in a dead glide going across there. So it's going to have to be a pretty good day in order to go that far. And you're going to be up and uh, actually doing some cross-country work. The glass guys, of course, yeah, maybe, maybe make it a little bit bigger. But uh, what else was I going to say? You said the, the wind. Oh, and <clears throat> for us here at uh, Blairstown, especially, listen up on, on this beginning, because this, this leg right here is along the ridge. And if you're qualified on the ridge, here at Blairstown, ACA has a quite elaborate uh, ridge checkout program that uh, really prepares you for nice ridge flying. And uh, if you're, you've been okay to do it, you can work in a ridge flight, a valley crossing, and then more high ground down here. And uh, that, that's a good combination. I think most airports have enough variety that you can sort of mix it up. Okay. I don't know where else I am here. Okay, we've talked about, uh, how am I doing? Ten minutes. Quick. Uh, <clears throat> things in flight. Take off, all I really have to say is, and something you should learn, but just keep telling yourself that, hey, you're, you're about to take a machine into the air, and it's, it's not necessarily a friendly machine. So... Get on top of it right there. Be, be ready for a crosswind. Be ready for a gust. Be ready for a, a rope break as you're going through 100 feet. you got all sorts of things to do there. Uh, release. Uh, uh, Bob was talking about uh, taking that and when to do the, the thermal. I'd write on, on that as far as I'm concerned. You ought to have a, when you take off, you ought to have an altitude, let us say, 2,000 feet, that you will not release, even if it hit the boomer. But once you reach 2,000 feet, you keep going until you hit a thermal, and then get off. Or, and you can make that when you're beginning at 3,000 feet or 4,000, whatever. But below that, you stay on. Once you're above that, 
I, I just can't, I don't like the release in dead air. I, it's got to be working somehow. It's, uh, I like to get off low too. Once, once you've worked, worked that low altitude, at first, let's say, uh, you're going to go to 3,000 no matter what. And then, you, oh, you did that a couple times, three times? Okay, now let's work it down to 25. How about two, et cetera, et cetera. Those are good. The task, I, I talked about those just now. Uh, longer tasks around here, we go tower to tower. For those of you ACA guys, it's uh, Catfish Tower, the Water Gap Tower, and Hope Tower. That's a nice big triangle. You see all sorts of different terrain. You get the effects of the wind, like Hank was talking about. That uh, You can start reading lots of time to read the clouds to deviate, all the things that uh, Eric and Bob have been talking about already. Navigation, I've already touched on that. This just out, nothing, nothing higher, nothing higher than uh, a go-to function on you. Don't put a task in there at this stage of the game. Yes, later on, you've got to learn how to use that machine somehow, but... Uh, Time to go home. In these flights we're talking about, you're always within gliding. You're not one, one thermal away. You're always within gliding at the airport. So time to go home is when that last thermal quits. So you start heading back to the airport, and along comes another bump. Well, you're going to take it. You're probably tired. The Blairstown deck is waiting for you. <laughs> All the guys want to hear what spectacular stuff you've been doing. And... Uh, but that, that's the time to take that bump. It's going to be a weak thermal. It's not going to be all that well organized. And it, it's going to be a grinder maybe. But if you just get in that, a few turns, and maybe uh, Harry Baldwin out in Hobbs, New Mexico, won a day in a 126 championship years ago. He said, I had two spectacular thermals. One of them was a 1,200-footer, almost from the base that I got it, which was pretty low on the ground, to over 10,000 feet. Wow, what's your second one? He said, that was a 100-footer. <laughs> this is in a straight-out task. The wind was blowing about 20 knots. And he was down to his last 1,000 feet. He caught a bubble, 100 feet. And he said he took that up to 10,000 feet. Took him forever. The wind's blowing him like crazy. He, he had over a diamond distance flight on that. Uh, so that, that last thermal minutes. was a beauty. That's 100 minutes. <laughs> there you are. Think about that. <laughs> yeah. When he could have landed very shortly. So he, he blew he got 40 down. miles doing it. Yeah. Pardon me. He blew 40 miles doing it. He's going <laughs> straight up. No, well, he's going with the wind. Yeah. 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 That's what it is. Spectacular. And then he glided from 10... Quite a flight. But those last thermals, I, those are when you're going to learn how to, how to work low. You're going to, because you're going to be probably be between 1,000 and 2,000. And you're, it's close. That ground's close. You're not used to that. And you, the sooner you get close to getting a, a weak bubble, working it close to the ground, comparatively speaking, the sooner you get that, the, the less stress you're going to have on those cross countries. So, da -da. anything else there? One, two. 65% of the accidents and gliders happen in the landing phase. So, uh, this, this is a biggie. Every, and I'm going to make sure, I know, time for perfection. You can, Doc, one of our, actually, uh, the guy who uh, was flying gliders out of Blairstown before hardly anybody else. Uh, called it tiger time. You're going back to landing, you're tired, it's been a long flight. This is a time to r really perk up and pay attention to air. just everything that's happening around. Traffic, wind, da da da. Goes off and on. Then off field trap, uh, off fields. To go cross country, you're going to have to learn how to land off field. And this is the, about the only way you're going to do it, except landing off field. And uh, this is Blairstown Airport. There's a deck in case anybody. Wants to <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and I, I've just marked it. This is about 3,000 foot runway. 
roughly. So I just blocked off, six, well, that's a 500 footer maybe, and these are two 600 footers. That you can just imagine you're in your mind, and when you're coming back to that airport, not only just aim to see how well you can get in these one or the other, or maybe all three in the same one. <laughs> but vary your pattern, screw around, have a good time, and uh, I'd like to talk more about that, but I think time's getting short. Summation, the first picture, that was a kid play, playing the piano. So after you've gone through all the things that I just talked about, that's where you'll be. <laughs> you'll be a concert pianist, just making, making that airplane sing in any way. So there's lots to learn. It, it's a lot of fun. You don't have to make this a grind. I, uh, I think getting the license is sort of, yeah, I don't like that so much. But getting out there and learning all this stuff, uh, it's just a lot of fun. Be safe. All the time be safe. Don't, don't, don't chance that. You're going you're gonna, to, don't, don't push yourself to be unsafe. You're going to get there one day anyway, no matter, <laughs> no matter what goes on. You're, you're going to find yourself in a place you don't want to be. Uh, enjoy the whole process, and uh, you'll be cross country before you know it. So, uh, any questions, real quick? One question. Oh, one question. No, 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 just one time for one question. So oh, we have time for one. Daniel didn't have one. I don't have a comment. You never discussed. Uh, turning both ways today. Doing what? what? Being proficient turning right oh, yes. and left. No, I, I didn't. I used to have a problem with that. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's one of the things. Uh, most everybody's pretty good at turning left. I'm not sure why. There's a couple good reasons. But it, I don't know. But every flight is good to, if, if you don't know where that thermal is, right or left, take it the way you weren't going the last time. Or you get halfway up, turn around, and go. It's really important because one of the etiquette things is you turn whatever you're in the same thermal going into it as somebody else, you will turn the same direction as that other guy. And if he's turning right and you don't know how to turn right, that, that makes it hard. So do learn that. That's very definitely important. Very good. Thanks, everybody.